I want to begin uh, by saying that we were not among the social scientists or political scientists or pundits who, before the election started, uh, knew that Bernie Sanders would do very well and that Donald Trump would get the nomination. In fact, uh, so most of the data that I'm reporting on today comes from um, YouGov Economist uh, survey, which is a recontact survey where we interview, re-interview the same people, same 5,000 people, once a month, and we have done so since May. And just to show you how prescient we were, uh, I, apparently this is relevant to what Bill Bar you asked Bill Barnett, who chickened out with his response. Um, <laughs> Sorry, right. Bill and I are friends, I'll get him. Um, so, uh, so the question was, we were sitting around in May and there were like 92 Republican candidates for president. And so we're looking down and we say, well, we don't, we can't, we don't have enough room to put all this on. So Trump's name came up and we said, forget that. He's, he's not a serious candidate, he won't be there in June. So as you see, we were exactly right. It turns out that, it turns out, you'll see, that that turned out to actually be a benefit to us. Uh, and I'll show you why, and uh, I'll show, when I get there, I'll explain it again. So, um, so the first thing I want to say is that uh, the United States has been in this period of, uh, it, first of all, it's very nice to talk to an audience that was actually alive in 2000. Uh, <laughs> I still. I still teach standard under, Stanford undergraduates in like 2000, when was that? Um, so uh, that was a time in which the Republicans, as you can see, had controlled the president and the House and Senate for uh, uh, six straight years, which was uh, uh, quite, quite impressive. And it led uh, Karl Rove uh, with Nicholas Simon, the New Yorker, to say the real prize is creating a Republican majority that would be as solid as the Democratic coalition. And Karl just wrote a book on the McKinley uh, realignment, 1896. Um, but the point is that that's in 2004, it looks like the Republicans are on a roll, and that's what happened, right? Because you remember 2006, and uh, the Republicans lost 30 seats in the House, they lost six seats in the Senate, they lost six governorships, and then comes 2008, President Obama won big, House, Senate, 60 seat, uh, veto proof, uh, veto, not veto proof, but uh, filibuster proof uh, majority in the Senate, and then, of course, that caused James Carville to write this book. 40 More Years, How the Democrats Will Rule the Next Generation. Now, that book is remaindered with, uh, <laughs> it's all right, I have remaindered books also. Uh, the, the difference is I got tenure with mine. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Then, then the point is, then came 2010, which is an unbelievable loss to the Democrats. They lost 63 House seats, six Senate seats, seven uh, governors, uh, 17, they lost control of 17 state chambers and all across the seats in the United States, they lost 675 legislative seats. And then, uh, so as you can see, if we look at this uh, period of, there's 2004, the stability, then there's instability, then there's stability, instability, instability, instability. So, um, that, uh, so that's the first thing. We live in uh, sort of unstable times. And the next thing I want to point out is that's not just us. This is uh, an instability, a political instability index from 1945 to the present across the following countries, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Greece, Ireland, and the Netherlands, small European countries. And you can see that, again, political instability in those countries is uh, building up. Now, it's kind of a technical definition of political instability, and I always say, if you want to know, you can just email me at dbrady at Stanford. I'll tell you how we did that, and thus far, I've got no requests. Um, <laughs> so, um, because it's a pretty simple point. There's a, so, the instability, and these are the big countries, France, Germany, Italy, and UK. Stability's up, and think about the UK. In 1951-52, in the United Kingdom, uh, those two elections that uh, one replaced Winston Churchill and then put him right back in, in those elections, the Labor and uh, uh, Labor and the Conservative Party's got 98.5% of the vote. Today, stayed stable, mother of parliamentary democracy, Britain. In the last election, there were six parties. The two major parties got less than 65% of the vote, and there were four other parties that got over 5%. So the political instability is not just in the US. And so if we look at where's the last time we had political instability 
uh, of any uh, of the of a similar period. It's the 1874-1896 period. Now, contrary to what a number of my undergraduate students think, I was not there. Uh, to a, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't observe this. Um, but but the point is, what's common to those two eras? And what is common uh, that drives instability in the European Union? And the answer is globalization. The, this is the period of the first great transformation of the world economy. Uh, and this was nothing compared to the present transformation of the world economy. And, and what's basically happened is in the United States and in all the European countries that I showed, the stability of the 50s where, or where countries essentially had a labor party or a party of the left and a party or parties of the right that opposed it. So in Italy, where they have 137 parties, uh, there still was always uh, the parties to the left, the socialist communists and their allies, and then the Christian Democrats, who were always somehow in the coalition. And what's happened is all those, and about 50% of the workforce, between 45 and 50% of the workforce in those countries was in fact uh, good, solid jo labor jobs. And those jobs, uh, unlike the 1890s, those jobs had uh, unemployment compensation, they had vacation time, they had retirement plans, they had pensions. And those jobs now, now those job number of those industrial jobs in the US has gone down to maybe 12%. Most of the European countries, a little higher in some European countries, but it's still, they're declining rapidly. 20% uh, would be a lot. And what happens during that period is, then the coalitions are hard to form. So the Democrats in the US were the party of the left, Republicans were the party of the right. In 1948, Harry Truman could actually win re-election on campaigning for, against Taft-Hartley and 14B, Clause 14B. So the, what, what, what happens is, as that goes, then the Democrats, they don't have that base, that labor base, those jobs, the industrial base, then they have to try and find somebody else to find partnerships. So they combine with, uh, academics and uh, San Francisco types, and guess what? Guys who work in factories don't exactly always agree with the politics of San Francisco. <laughs> the same thing has happened in the European uh, Union countries and in OECD countries. S political coalitions are not as stable as they used to be. They flip around because of this transition uh, of these, uh, uh, away from these jobs. Uh, so, so that's the background that says, so don't think that the United States and Donald Trump is just a particular phenomenon in the uh, U.S. That's a phenomenon all over. Now, because of the U.S. political institutions, in the U.S. it has to happen within a political party. In France, because of the French political system, you get uh, the Front National and La Pen. Uh, and in Denmark, you get the popular front. So, but the point is, it, it's the same phenomenon, in my view, is it's the same phenomenon occurring all across the world. And it's to the right, the populism of the right, because it's a question of immigration. Immigration drives a good deal of this. The only place where the populism is on the left is in Greece. And why is it on the left in Greece? Because no one is immigrating to Greece believing they're going to get a job. <laughs> so. The, the right-wing populism is in countries where the people are immigrating and they're, take, they're picking up jobs and that causes resentment. And so that's, that's the situation. And so that's the context of the US election. <clears throat> the final context is this is, uh, I should actually spend about three hours on this because it took us years to collect this. This is all the Gallup polls from 1937. Not all of them, it's 1,300 Gallup polls from 1937 went the first Gallup poll until that's 2015, 2016, actually. And this is party identification, Democrats, Republicans, Independents. So what I want to, I, I don't got to go through the whole history of it, but the point is uh, about 1984 with Ronald Reagan, what we got was a huge change. Over most of this time period, the Democrats had very solid leads. This is the lead coming out of the New Deal. This is the lead uh, coming out of uh, uh, Goldwater, uh, et cetera, the 58 recession. And that's the Nixon phenomenon. But now note, in 1984, uh, it's not, not so much that Republicans rise, but that Democrats fall dramatically. Republicans were about there, and then they kind of even out. But the independents rise. And the fact is, we now have a political system where about a third of the, a third of the members, a little over a third, are Democrats. Uh, then there are Republicans, and uh, finally, uh, independents. So, uh, but the bottom line is that this is a new political system and it's again helps to create that instability uh, helps to create that instability I talked about. Okay. 
Now, what happened to the American political parties is that what, you call, what people normally call polarization, I'm going to call this uh, sorting. And so what do I mean by sorting? So imagine here's the Democrats uh, prior to, again, it's nice to point this out. Some of you actually remember when there were uh, Rockefeller, there were liberal Republicans, and there were conservative Democrats. So that's the poll. So at this time, imagine the party looks like it has 50 liberals, 30 moderates, 20 conservatives, and then there's some independents. But the conservative party has some liberals in it. Now what's happened is the switch is now the liberal party has 70 liberals, 30 moderates, and then the moderates, they've gone. So they have a few moderates in each party, but the parties have sorted. They actually look more like European political parties now in that the Democrats are further left and the Republicans are further right. Because one is further left, further right, then what happens is there are more people in the middle who are independent. People move to independence because uh, in the United States, uh, people, uh, the independents are more conservative than Democrats on economic policy, but they're more liberal than Republicans on social policy. So generally, these independents are sort of in the middle, and they float back and forth depending upon candidates in particular elections. Okay, so now we're, that's the background, now we're to the elections. So, <laughs> these are pretty shocking numbers. Uh, this is how many government officials are crooked, and this is a question you believe that a lot of government officials are crooked. And now you can see the number uh, in the early years here, not so many. In the Bush administration, Democrats thought there were more crooks, uh, Republicans less, and now Republicans think there are more crooks and Democrats less, and independents in the middle. But no, the numbers who think that, the, that there are a lot of crooks in government, that number is, uh, has risen. The second number over here is people believing government is run for a few big interests. And again, you see partisan differences here, but they sort of start to average out here, and the number is increase. Uh, just a couple more. Percentage be uh, believing government is run for the benefit of all by year and party ID. That number used to be uh, pretty, uh, Democrats, it was in the 40s, but you can see partisan differences. But note now that in 2016, Democrats, independents, and Republicans, less than, uh, less, about 6% of people believe that the government is run for the benefit of all. So that's a pretty dramatic decline. And then uh, the number of people thinking government doesn't care about them has also risen to uh, new highs. So you have, uh, and then let me ask a question. We, uh, at YouGov, we, uh, we, we did a couple extra besides the recontact, but we did an anger survey. How many of you hear or read something, hear or uh, read something uh, that makes you mad on a daily basis or more than once a day? <laughs> Jesus, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it turns out that uh, about 57% of Americans uh, hear something or read something uh, or listen to something or listen to TV, something that makes them mad at least once a day. That's, that's a pretty high number. Um, and it's, it was about 50% uh, among you. So I guess because I'm a political scientist, it it's all makes me pretty cynical. Uh, so I... I don't get that mad. All right, down to the nominations. So the nominations are pretty straightforward. In each case, uh, there is an establishment and anti-establishment, and the Democrats, uh, the establishment candidate won. Now, uh, it was, uh, some people thought it would be another uh, Hillary uh, coronation, like uh, 2008 was supposed to be, and it wasn't. Why? Because she's unpopular. And you can see, this is from July of 2015. Democrats favored her about 77, but 19% said they had an unfavorable view of her. 14% of Democrats said they'd never vote for her. Among independents, it was 64% unfavorable, and 39% said they wouldn't vote for her. And among, well, forget it, among Republicans, 87% <laughs> said they never vote for her. So, so the fact is, she was going to get some opposition. So the question is, no one thought that the opposition that would be successful would be a, uh, the, uh, what do we call him, the non-establishment candidate who'd been in Congress for 30 years. Bernie Sanders had been in Congress for 30 years. Hardly anyone had ever heard of him, uh, except people in Vermont. He was actually elected as a socialist. 
uh, not, not a very efficient senator by virtue of what he got passed, etc. So out of nowhere comes Bernie Sanders to uh, pose a real threat uh, to Mrs. Clinton. Now, uh, this table says, so we asked the question on uh, this recontact survey, uh, survey said, uh, do you believe that uh, the American system favors the wealthy? And among people who said, yes, it does favor the wealthy, pretty sizable number, here among Democrats, even there, Mrs. Clinton managed to beat Bernie Sanders 51-43. But among independents, many of which are younger people, younger you are, the more likely you are to be independent, see that Sanders among independents who believe that, 52 to 19. So that's, that's part of his base. Then you move to, if you think the American economy is sort of fair to most, then uh, she really killed him and his margin over her doesn't go. And among people who weren't sure, either way, uh, she did very well. So his, the guts of his support came from these people who were worried about inequality, et cetera, et cetera. And that a lot of Stanford students um, were, uh, I don't know, they seemed very worried about inequality. Um, that's a little hard to understand. Uh, <laughs> in the class, when, when I asked my public policy class, they said, so how many of your parents are in the upper class? They all raised their hands. So I, I stopped at that point. I, I want to make sure my teaching ratings are OK. Uh, OK. Now, here's the, re here's the Republicans. This is, this, is 19, this is 2012. So you remember that. So and, uh, establishment candidates were Mitt Romney. Always looked good. Then first, there was Michelle Bachman. Remember her? Choo, down. Then, and then along came uh, the governor of Texas, uh, Perry, uh, no, Kane, uh, Herman Cain. Remember him? The Kermit King was there, and then found out he was some executive, and then he had some affair, and he was gone. And then it was Governor Perry, and then he forgot what he was going to shut down. <laughs> and, then, uh, and, then, and then it became Rick Sam, uh, Newt Gingrich and so on. But at the end, it was kind of like a King of the Hill day, where what happened is Romney was always the leader. Somebody would come up and approach him, and then they'd fall away and fall away, and ultimately Romney got the nomination. So that's uh, a pretty typical pattern. Uh, for Republicans, and that's why we didn't include Donald Trump, okay? So, I want to back off on this, sir. So, we had just finished a study of uh, seven European countries on immigration, and it turns out that the best, uh, there are two good predictors, the, uh, one of the two best predictors of whether you are anti-immigrant was if you asked the question, you said, how has your family done over the last one, three years, five years? Is it been doing better or worse? People who said their uh, family's economic, financial situation was worse, they were the ones who were most anti-immigrant, okay? So we had asked that of our sample, but we didn't include Donald Trump, because we didn't think. So here's the results. So you can see, of people, 38% of Republicans, thought that their economic situation had been worse over the last year. So of them, uh, when we asked what was their preference in May, the number one thing they were for, they had no preference. Number two was Scott Walker, who had about 13%, etc. <clears throat> well, then, <clears throat> then Trump came in, uh, made his anti-immigrant, made his uh, build a border wall, build a wall in Mexico, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then uh, we'll, we'll cut back on the number of Muslims, or whatever he said. And then, uh, now we have Trump in. Now look at. So of people who thought that their economic situation had worsened, their family said it worsened over the last year, Trump now has 41% of these. That means, because that's 38%, that turns out to be about three quarters of his support. So in July, he's the leader among 17 candidates with 22% of the vote. This is the basis of uh, where the vote's coming from. And uh, the question is, at that time, there's a lot of fighting in the Republican primary. So who's going to be the anti-establishment candidate? Well, Trump's there. Carly Fiorina's there. Uh, Senator Cruz is there. Uh, the surgeon is there. And so Car Governor, Mr. Carson's there, there. So the question is, they're fighting to be the outsider. And on the other side, they're fighting to be the insider. I want to be the outsider. It's Bush versus Kasich versus, uh, versus Rubio, et cetera, et cetera. And during all that fighting, nobody drops out. And the Republican Party had done two things. They pushed the delegate count up forward. They had more delegates earlier. And two, they had more winner-take-all primaries. 
So Trump uh, does, uh, takes advantage of that. And uh, so that's uh, the good thing about us not getting that right was if we had had Trump in the first one, uh, we wouldn't have noted uh, that difference. Now, and here is just, this is, a, so here I don't have the same group. This is less affluent Republicans. These are people who are Republicans who have high school or less and make, make less than $50,000 a year, okay? So you can see, compared to all the other Republicans, they always are more supportive of Trump, and in the end, they're like 21 in uh, May and July, right when he's cleansing the nomination. You can see uh, he's 20 to 22 points more popular with less affluent Republicans than he is with other Republicans, okay? And that uh, is a long, uh, short story of uh, how, how he gets the nomination. Okay, now during the course of the nomination, um, both Mrs. Clinton, they didn't, their popularity doesn't, doesn't really shoot up. Uh, this is Clinton and Trump. She has a little bit of an advantage on them, but remember, uh, most Americans, still 54% of Americans, uh, have an unfavorable view of her. The reason she has an advantage is because even more people have an unfavorable opinion of Trump. <laughs> so uh, this is the, these are the two most unpopular candidates that, uh, that I'm, I'm that, that, since we've taken polls and where we have any information, like starting in 40, uh, no, we've had no information, nothing, nothing to compare to this. Okay. Now the elections. Uh, this is just one to show you that pollsters can be wrong. Uh, August 88, uh, Bush is uh, losing to Dukakis by 17 points. Uh, you remember President Dukakis. Um, <laughs> so, however, note if you look at the rest of those, what really happens is when you make your, uh, the largest number of errors is out, or the earlier you are. As you get past Labor Day, uh, not, much, not much of a problem. Uh, the, the stuff tightens up. Uh, people, are, people who say they're going to vote for Trump are going to vote for Trump. People who say they're going to vote for Clinton are going to vote for Clinton. Things tie down, and it gets easier on uh, those of us uh, who do polling and uh, write about the polls. It gets easier because uh, public opinion stabilizes then, okay? So now I'm going to just talk a little bit about... Uh, uh, what happens, and, and these are two points that uh, turn out to go against Republicans. First is turnout. This is turnout back 1788. Uh, and beginning about 1828, uh, the, and I could explain that, but no one really cares. So, uh, <laughs> well, actually, that's Andrew Jackson, and uh, because he got jipped out of the presidency, put political parties together, put elections on a regular basis, and the 1832 Census Act, but it's okay. Um, so, at, but if you look across that whole time span, what you see is that in off-year elections, uh, there's about a, it averages about 15%. 15% fewer people vote in off-year elections than vote in presidential election years. So who turns out? So uh, this, this hurts uh, Republicans because uh, here's 2008, 2010. Uh, what happens is uh, there are fewer in an off-year election there are fewer young voters, more older voters, uh, more white voters, fewer black voters, fewer Hispanic voters. And since if you look at those groups, those groups generally tend to favor Democrats. In a presidential election year, you expect Democrats to do uh, better than they did in the uh, prior election. And so here are uh, voter turnout by race in 2000, uh, 2004, 8, and 12. And as you can see, uh, uh, this is white turnout, 2, 4, 8, 12. So as you can see, uh, the number of white voters uh, decreases over time. The number of uh, African-American voters increases. The number of uh, Latino voters increases. And the number of Asian-American voters increases. And since those groups are, are more Democratic on average than they are Republican, that uh, means presidential elections are affected. And here's a uh, white share of the population in swing states. And so you can see, again, 8, 12, and 16. You can see generally the pattern. And these, uh, I leave these slides on. And if anybody wants a copy of the slides, just ask them, not me. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, 
given the pay I'm getting, it's okay. I'm <laughs> zero. Uh, okay. So that's why it was okay if you wanted to talk and not sit down for a while. Pace. Actually, my pay went up. Uh, okay. So this is uh, Latino share of uh, the vote in swing states. So you can see Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Nevada, those percentages, uh, the percentage of Latino voters are up. Arizona, Colorado, and Florida, and Nevada are all swing states, and Latino voters are uh, more heavily represented there, okay? And that should all, when you think about the elections, you have to think about that changing electorate. And here's the African-American, uh, Asian-American share of population in swing states. Uh, Virginia is one where it makes a difference, and Nevada is another. Okay, so Republicans have, on average, I would say a 20 to 25 percent electoral college gap, given the way that set of voters is distributed across states. So, how many of you are from California? Anybody here think Trump will win California? <laughs> okay, New York. Think Trump will win New York? Illinois? No. So. Oh, it's okay, I'm from Illinois too. It's, they generally, they generally, by the way, they haven't admitted anyone from the American Midwest here for 30 years, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of me and you, it's me and you. Uh, so that's, those are the states they just fly over. Uh, okay, so, so the Republicans have this electoral deficit. It's about 20 to 25 uh, uh, in, in the electoral college for the reasons I try. Now, it used to be a lot better to predict these elections, and this is the good part. And here is uh, a quote from a book uh, written in 2010 by Lynn Vavrick, a very good uh, social scientist at UCLA. And this, she didn't say this, but the blurb of the book says, the economy is so powerful in determining the results of presidential elections, political scientists can predict winners and losers with amazing accuracy. And that was kind of true. And here's the uh, most famous of the models, called the FAIR model. Not because it's particularly FAIR, but the guy who did it was guy, uh, Ray FAIR, who's an economist at Yale. <laughs> so now what's, what's useful, what's interesting about this model is they're, they're, all the economic models are retrospective. All they, all they want to say is, look, if the economy's doing well, the two or three quarters before the election, the president's party gets, people walk in the booth and they go, gee, the economy's pretty good. I'll support the president, or I'll support the president's party. If the economy is not doing well, they punish the president and they punish the president's party. So all that Ray Fair knows in this model, all he knows is what in the three quarter, two quarters prior to the election is real GDP growth. That's all he knows. GDP growth minus inflation, that number, plus the number of quarters in the uh, last 16 quarters where the growth was over three. That's all he knows. He doesn't know how popular the president is. He doesn't know if we're at war. He knows nothing. And look at the model. Look at how it works. That is the actual versus the predicted. To know just that, pretty damn impressive. So, um, and then well, the other thing was the two, the two years they really missed were 52 and uh, 68. And, uh, oh, so, and then, by the way, sorry, in 2012, these models started to go wrong. Uh, Fair missed. A second model, by the way, is guns and bread. The second model said, well, the reason, there's two things at work. It's not just the economy. It's if Americans are at war somewhere, war, uh, many, too many troops abroad, that'll hurt the, the president's party. And so this is a uh, guns and butter. Uh, and note that uh, the 2000 and 1952. So this is elections from 80 on. And the line, the predictions are really pretty good. The only one that was really off was the 2000 election, and that was when Al Gore ran the worst campaign in American history. Uh, I can explain that later. Um, so the bottom line, though, was they got all these right. And here's what, uh, here's what Doug Hibbs' model predicted for, uh, 19, uh, for 2012. Obama would get 45%. Here's Ray Fair's prediction for this year. Mrs. Clinton will get 50, 45%. I think it's probably down to 44 now. But why, why is that? Well, if you're going to have a retrospective model of the economy, then people have to perceive the economy the same way. That is, if the economy is going to have, all Americans have to say the economy is doing pretty well, therefore I'll reward the president, or it's doing badly, we'll harm the president. So here is uh, our YouGov data. 
from uh, uh, 2008 to 2012. And here's uh, the percent of Americans thinking the economy is getting better. Well, so it moves just about like you'd expect it to move, only it depends on who you ask. Democrats thought the economy is doing great. Republicans thought it sucked all the way through. And independents were in the middle. So retrospective models can't work if Democrats think the economy is better or worse than it actually is. And Republic, in other words, if people are using partisan lens to say how well the economy is doing, those models will not be as accurate. Now, obviously, there's a lot of work. But if it's in the range of the economy grew between 1% and 2.5%, that, that is the range in which people would be able to disagree about the effects. If it grows 8% or you lose 18%, then, then that's not, probably not relevant. But uh, we don't have the... We have now just collected the data back to 1992. But this phenomena first pops up where you get significant differences between Democrats and Republicans on how the economy is doing. It first pops up in about 2005. <coughs> Prior to that, uh, Democrats and Republicans, they moved together. OK. So then how did Obama win? OK, so here's the way. Uh, in uh, 2012, there were 38% Democrats, 32% uh, Republicans, and 30% independents. Obama won 92% of the uh, uh, Democrats, uh, and uh, Romney won 93% of Republicans. So roughly speaking, and they split the rest of it. So basically what happens is uh, President Obama got a, but the same percent of a bigger number that Romney got of a smaller number. So basically, if you think of it, going into the independence, uh, Romney had to make up a six-point difference. And he didn't, OK? Uh, he won independence, but he didn't win big enough. So overall, he loses 51-47. Uh, so here's, uh, and, and when you think of the parties, uh, the, the par uh, parties are aligned by groups. So as we look at that, we see that men made up 47% of the electorate. And uh, they voted by 7%. There was a gender gap. 7% of men voted for Romney. But among women, there was an 11, uh, they made 53% of the electorate. And there was an 11% gender gap toward uh, President Obama. So he, he gets a plus there. Among whites, uh, Romney wins by about 20 points. Among blacks, uh, Romney uh, loses big. Among Latinos, he loses big. High school, now here's, here's going to be a difference between now. High school uh, graduates are about 25% of the population, and uh, Romney, uh, 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 Obama won them. And now uh, college, uh, the opposite, uh, college graduates, and they, as they have since 1952, when we have data on this, uh, college graduates have always voted uh, on, on a margin, voted Republican. OK, so then uh, what I want to look at is here's the YouGov, uh, here's the YouGov polls. Uh, so generally speaking, and this first one is, uh, this, this one here is uh, what, what the panel is in July. This is August, and that's our first poll in September. And you can see that in general, uh, the Democrats have between a 9 and 10 point lead over Republicans. Uh, and that, so that's the first thing. So when I'm trying to look at uh, what Bill Barnett said about predicting, you're trying to predict what's going to happen. I want to know how many Democrats there are and how many Republicans. So, and here, there are more Democrats now than there were in 2012. OK? And now the second one, uh, presidential vote intent. These are Democrats. These are Democrats in uh, June, August, and September. I have some more re recent data, which I'll show you in just a second. But you can see that Mrs. Clinton uh, started running into trouble. She was at 82%. Then she was at 73%, and then she bumped up a little bit to 77%. That was right after the first debate. But in short, she hadn't yet sealed the deal with Democrats. Obama was at 93%. She, she wasn't there. Now, how about uh, Trump? So this is uh, Trump in uh, June and August, and then now we have September. And again, uh, Trump hadn't sealed the deal. He went from 74 to 77. Then after the first debate, he was back down to 72. So you can see on that grounds that the deal is sealed. It's not exactly like the, there's more uncertainty out there among, among the parties. And uh, now this is independence. And this is independence in, uh, again, July, 
uh, so, so that's, I'm sorry, that should be June, July, no, uh, June, July, and September. Uh, but again, the point is that among independents, Trump was winning, but he's not winning by enough to make up that uh, partisan difference. So through most of this, we had it got down to two points at one point, but most of the time we were three, four points uh, uh, for Mrs. Clinton with this recontact survey. Now here is the kind of plot of that, and here is, uh, I could not finish plotting it this morning, uh, but I did uh, have our latest poll after Mrs. Trump did not have a good week. Mrs. Clinton is now at 88% of Democrats, big jump up. Uh, Trump is at 81, uh, and now independents are split dead even. That's in our poll. Uh, I just saw a Fox poll, uh, and the Fox poll has uh, her at about 91% of Democrats, and she now leads among independents 36, 35, and Trump has fallen to 74% among Republicans. So, so as I look at the election, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the, only, the only thing that's kind of uh, striking is uh, there, we still have 15, 16% who won't get, so our seven, 8% or so still say they'll vote for Johnson, Stein, some other third party candidate, and 8% say they're undecided, okay? So uh, we know that third party candidates, as you get closer to the election, the normal pattern for them is to fall. John Anderson, when he ran, nice to be able to mention that. Some people know who he was. Uh, John Anderson uh, was at like 13, 14%, ended up with much less, four, four and a half, something like that. But the bottom line is the vote for those candidates, Ralph Nader in 2000 was at six, 7%, finally falls to below two. So we expect that those, those that 15, 16% that's undecided or uh, as voting for a third, we assume some will move. So we, we, we pull them aside and we for, uh, ask them to say, okay, uh, and we don't ask this of anyone else, but just the people who are undecided or voting for third, we say, if the election were held, who would you vote for? Uh, if, you had to, if you had to vote. So if you had to choose, so we're trying to, for, we're trying to say, can we guess if it's, if it's gonna move at the end, which way is it gonna move? We do this, uh, I call a force question. Uh, if you had to choose, would you are likely to vote? And here, uh, again, you see Mrs. Clinton gets 39.24. And I believe if I had time to analyze our poll, which uh, were just, the data were just coming out 10 o'clock this morning, uh, I believe that uh, that gap, uh, I believe there are going to be fewer. The 15% is going to go down to 10%, and the numbers uh, for, uh, and the numbers for uh, Trump will uh, go down some more. So I think he's uh, eight points down. So here is the, here's the battle. And so we do the, uh, we, you, Gov, I'm not paid by them. I'm, I'm on an advisory board, but it's, I advise it so I can get data. Um, so the, uh, the, we do, uh, you, Gov also does the battleground states. So we super sample 5,000 voters in each of the battleground states. Uh, and so this is the battleground state poll which is different from the one I talked about. So this was uh, July or August, where Mrs. Clinton was at 217 and Trump was 191, where, where kind of the big states uh, were, uh, Colorado was up, Iowa was up, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, and New Hampshire, those states were all, we weren't sure who would win. <clears throat> and this is pre the first debate, when uh, Trump, uh, the email stuff had come out, and it was pretty close then, that's the point where we had her up by one point. And now you can see that the Electoral College gap has uh, tightened, and uh, you have, uh, again, the same states up, but other states had swung. Okay, so what's it look like today? Uh, today, uh, uh, our last poll was we had 260, for Mrs. Clinton with uh, the states that were up for grabs are Nevada, Florida, Georgia, uh, Ohio, and Minnesota. So I, I believe that Iowa will go for uh, Trump, uh, and I think Arizona will go for Trump. Uh, I believe Florida will go for um, uh, Clinton, Georgia will go for Trump, and uh, Ohio will go, uh, Ohio will also go for Trump. 
So, but that's plenty of votes to take her over. So the question is, uh, it doesn't, uh, it, uh, as you look at that map, it looks pretty hard for him to be able to get there. And now uh, I have to finish with the Senate. Uh, so here's the Senate uh, today, 46, we have 46, 46 Democrat. Uh, the only state we have for sure uh, swinging is we have Illinois uh, going, to, um, going to the Democrats. So what other states are up? Uh, I, I, I'm just going to give these out because I'll, I'll give you my prediction because if I'm wrong, who cares? Uh, what can you do? <laughs> what can you do to me? Um, ooh, he was wrong. Um, so uh, I think Indiana will, Indiana will go Democratic. I think New Hampshire, uh, Kelly Ayotte will lose. Uh, Rubio will win Florida. Uh, I have no idea in Nevada. And so I, my prediction would be, and Wisconsin will also ultimately go uh, Democrat. So my prediction at this point is 50-50, uh, 50, 50, 50 Democrat, 50, although it could go 51-49 uh, at this point. Now, to the extent uh, that Mrs. Clinton's lead increases, that drops the Republicans' candidate. Now, what about the House of Representatives? Well, that's hard to move. Um, so we have 200, they have 231, you need 218. They have 207 seats over here in uh, these two categories that look pretty safe to us. Uh, and then the Democrats have a whole bunch of seats that look safe there. So it's only this set of seats in here. So my best guess at this point is it's closer than it was 10 days ago. Uh, I, 10 days ago, I would have said the Republicans will lose eight seats. Uh, now, uh, now the Republicans, I think, are at about 220, 222 for sure. But if Mrs. Clinton Lee continues to pop up, uh, then that then it could be at stake. The uh, generic ballot question, which is the one we usually ask, uh, if you had to vote in the election, would you vote for a Democrat or a Republican? Uh, the Democrats are now close. It's 4.4. Generally, that has to be around uh, somewhat over six to change as many seats as are necessary. So I think that that's it. Questions? <laughs> Just a second, I have to turn on my, uh, what is that, what do you call those things? Hearing assisted, yeah, okay. I have a question. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, back here. Um, do you think there are any closet Trump supporters that won't give you the proper answer but may come out and support him? Well, we, uh, so that's a question that comes up all the time. <clears throat> I, uh, so we, we take that seriously. Uh, uh, it's somewhat similar to the Bradley effect that people talked about. So, uh, so I went back, uh, we went back and looked at all of our polls in the primaries. That is, were we off, were we, YouGov, were we off in any, YouGov economist polls, were we off in any of the primaries? And uh, sure, but we were within two or three points. Did we predict the state wrong? No. When we thought Trump would won, he won. So the best uh, is, is what you say possible? Yes. Uh, do we have any evidence of it? I can't find it, uh, find it, so the best we could do is go back and look at uh, what people said they vote and how the state vote turned out in the primaries. We didn't get any difference there. On the other hand, I don't have Democratic blue-collar voters. Uh, I don't have Democratic uh, people who would normally vote Democratic who are blue-collar. Uh, they might not say, they're, they're the set. So we're looking at them and oversampling them and uh, Thus far, have, have, uh, have, not found, have not found any evidence of it. Doesn't, doesn't mean it's not there, but I don't, I don't think it is. Uh, yes? Yeah, as to the That's a very smart. That's a very smart question, and and yeah, unfortunately, I will. Uh, <laughs> the reason is I can't answer it. So, <clears throat> um, so he says. Uh, well, he said. So has anybody looked at the fact that uh, as people see what's going on with the economy, 
they tailor their campaigns to it. And as they start to tailor their campaign to it, that would interact back and change. So that's called an endogeneity problem. And uh, we've collected the data back to 1992. And uh, my colleague, Doug Rivers, who is a superb statistician, uh, he'll have to solve. We know that's a problem. Uh, and he's working on it, but I am not, I personally am not capable of solving that problem. And uh, as you can see why it's a difficult problem, but he says he's got some model that can do it, and, and I believe him when he does it. Um, so, I mean, he's capable, but it's a tough problem. It's a very good question. So it just could be endogenous, and, and we don't know. Oh, <clears throat> all right, so the economy, the economy is booming. We're paying off the debt. There's two people unemployed in America. We're all getting rich. And Al Gore decides to run to the left. His campaign slogan should have been, you like the last eight years? Stick with me. I'll keep my zipper up, and the next four years will be great. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> if he ran with that campaign, he wins. But for some reason, he chose to run to the left, giving Bush an opportunity to come in with compassion and conservatism and take the votes. So when we mean by the worst vote, all those models predicted that the Democrats would win by eight, eight points. Now, they did win the popular vote, but the fact that it was as close as it was is what we mean by a bad campaign. Yep. Oh, well, yeah, I, okay, so I don't know what's happening, so I have no idea. Are you asking the question? Oh, no. Thank you very much. Uh, on, um, on that note, how do you incorporate the individual uh, campaigns and politicians into the larger <laughs> macroeconomic uh, picture? Well, the way I, uh, the way I tried to model it, <clears throat> another good question. Can I ask somebody ask me a question? <laughs> Straightforward question. Who's going to win? No. Uh, <laughs> Look, so, so his question is, uh, how, how, do I, how do I know how much is the campaign and how much is other? So the way I used to use that economic model was to say that was the baseline, that all, a ceteris paribus, all other things being equal, then uh, you would expect that would be the result. So you could try and measure the campaign based on uh, how well that model predicted, and then you, could look at then you could look at mistakes. So we would poll, say, in 2012, we pulled, for, remember the for, Romney 47% mark and the Etch-a-Sketch, and uh, we had all that stuff in, and it turns out that those things don't matter very much. The, I'll give you an example. On, on, on the 47%, can't, won't vote for me because blah, blah, blah. So uh, the first week we asked that question, about 65% actually had heard of it and got it right. They knew who said it. A week later, it was down to like 50% remembered it. At the end of one month, only 35% of voters remembered it, and half of them got it wrong. They thought it had been said by the other candidate. <laughs> so, so those aren't the things. So then the problem is the aggregation problem, right? You, you, uh, it builds up. Okay, it, it simply builds up, and then suddenly people decide on the basis of all that evidence, but it's hard to put that evidence together. So let me uh, say on the, Trump, the Fox News poll, uh, which I just got from Darren Shaw, uh, who's the, their pollster, they're, he's the, they have a Republican, a Democrat, uh, Darren's uh, the Republican who does that poll. He just sent me uh, their results, and uh, they find now that uh, there's a swing Women over 45, 12% <clears throat> moved away from Trump from their previous poll, and they had a uh, women over, so women over 45, and uh, elderly people had also moved 11 points. Over. And in their polls, Mrs. Clinton now led on everything, even though, even this is the most amazing thing, of, Republic, of people who thought that Obama, the president's health care program should be repealed. 52% of them thought that she would do a better job on health care than him. So there's movement now. There should still be some movement back. But it's that kind of aggregate movement that you try to measure, and, and it's hard. Uh, I have no idea, yeah. So can I ask a question? So I'm, I'm a visitor here from uh, Hong Kong. 
Okay. So we, from outside looking in, yeah. we couldn't figure out. Say that again, please. We are, <laughs> we are disappointed at the quality of the candidates because. <laughs> Well, that no. certainly makes you unusual. <laughs> no, I think uh, yeah. with uh, this country, uh, so many brilliant people, you know? And here, the politi politicians, I don't know what they're doing. Can you explain? I mean, you should do a survey and find out why they pick these kind of candidates. I don't, I don't need a survey. In, in 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote what is still the best book on American politics, American democracy. Alexis de Tocqueville has a chapter, and the chapter is entitled, well, how will America, how could, how could America fail? Well, how, what's the best, what's the reason? And his answer was, it will, it will fail because the quality of its candidates, the people who are in Congress, who he just finished, he just finished having lunch with Daniel Webster and Davy Crockett, and he said, gee, the really smart Americans never run. They all get MBAs. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, so the answer is, uh, we've always had that, but this year, uh, a, your, uh, I have no answer to your question. I mean, <laughs> it's a damn good question, and I have no answer. I don't know how it could have happened. I mean, I could BS for a while, but it's, that's what it'd be. Yeah, sorry, she wants you to take the mic. There seems to be a large number of folks who would say, I'm not voting for either one, but may vote down ballot. And that seems to be very unusual, right? So yep. thoughts on that? So uh, have you been advising Paul Ryan lately? <laughs> uh, so, what that, so what that means is, uh, in 1992, uh, the Republicans uh, had, they won their first majority in the House, Senate, uh, they, they had to control the United States House, first time in 40 years, 1994. And they had control of the Senate, but they won that in 80. So uh, they decided, they knew Dole was gonna lose, and Senator Dole knew he was gonna lose. So they concentrated their campaign on states and ways to keep the House of Representatives. They, they moved the campaign money away from the presidential campaign, had Dole move to states uh, where it might make a difference, is appearing, and they put all their money there. I think that's what you're gonna see the Republicans start to do, and I actually believe uh, with uh, the polls that are now coming out, uh, one poll has 11 point lead, the Fox poll has uh, I think an eight or nine point lead. So I think what's gonna happen, their, their uh, candidates are now gonna start to say that. They're gonna start to say, look, I know we, Republican congressional candidates are gonna start to say, look, I know we've lost the, we, we've lost the presidency, don't let her have the House and the Senate. So I think that's uh, the next, and in terms of our polling, uh, we decided uh, two days ago that uh, we would start, start to lay off on the polling uh, president. We'll do some, but we're going to concentrate our effort on the House and Senate because that's where we believe the action is. So, so I think that's what's happened. I right, have time for one or two more, yeah. <laughs> Are there any elections that have... Uh, um, are there any... Jeez, sorry I asked. Uh, are there any previous elections <clears throat> that were, uh, had so much hate? Yeah, lots of them. Uh, and they ran against Andrew Jackson's wife saying she was a prostitute. Uh, remember Grover Cleveland, Ma, the slogan against him was, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Because he'd had a child out of wedlock. Warren Harding, when he got the nomination, and uh, they called and said, they said, you have to call your mistress to find out if she'll tell, da 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 da. So uh, there, there have been. Now, there have not been, there haven't been, that hasn't happened since the rise, really, of radio and TV. Now, so, and this is just pure speculation, but I think one of the things that happened was when we had three TV stations, uh, when an event occurred, there was kind of a common Walter Cronkite interpretation of them. You imagine mentioning to Stanford undergraduates a Walter Cronkite interpretation. <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, so while, uh, Walter, there was a common sort of interpretation. In the, so the, and the point I'm making is, in, in the days in which those campaigns were so vile, remember the Lincoln, camp, Lincoln uh, campaign was not uh, pretty for the president. So but in those days, the press was not objective. It was exceedingly partisan. Right? There was, a, there was a Republican paper, a Democrat paper, a Whig paper, et cetera, et cetera. So now uh, what's happened with our media is we've started to start to go away from that, right? Uh, news, if you watch Fox News, it says something. If you listen to NPR, it says something. If you, so that's sort of broken up. You can listen to whatever you want. You can only listen to one side, not get the others. And the TV uh, regular news stations don't have an hour-long report. They don't have not as many people watching. So we're kind of going back. So my hypothesis is roughly, we're sort of going back to that old partisan press, and partisan presses are inclined, maybe inclined to give you those kinds of primaries, and, and so we'll see. Now, Timothy Garton Ash, a British scholar, uh, has been studying this in Europe and the US, and he argues that because in the European countries, they don't have, they don't, they don't allow so many different kinds of stations, they don't get the same kind of phenomena, and he has some data on that, I'm not, I mean, it's a, good, a really good idea. I'm not convinced that the data show that it's uh, correct yet. So I'll take uh, that one more. Yeah, OK. Uh, yes, could you speak to the importance of women generally and the importance of women <laughs> and the importance of women to the electorate? Well, I'm married. I've been married for 47 years. I have three daughters uh, <laughs> who still speak to me. Um, mm -hmm. they, they still speak to me. And uh, they all make more money than I do, and I'm really happy about that. Um, yeah, so women, uh, so women in the electorate are, uh, that's Trump's biggest problem, obviously, and they've fallen away more. So they're 53% of the electorate. In general, uh, my friend Morris Fiorina has a paper that argues that women tend to be more democratic because, in general, uh, they're nicer, kinder, more sympathetic, and want to reach out to help people. Uh, in comparison to men, and, and there's a, a significant amount of survey research data that shows that. But uh, in uh, significance of women in general, I'm, uh, I'll give you the names and addresses of my daughters, and you can write them, and they can tell you. So thank you, thank you very much.